and welcome to Barn Blog. And today we need to talk about the way we talk about unions or why I am tired of being gaslit about sounding an alarm that the union uptick that we saw in the aught teens has ended. While most of the media and a large part of the left are telling you that we're actually in good steed and union militarization has increased. The first sign of a problem was how little the left talked about the situation in 2001 when liberals were pointing out that after the COVID-19 pandemic, unionized industries, particularly heavy industry and parts of the public sector had lost unionization. Now there was a buildup to the Amazon uh, unionization call and a couple of defeats, then the victory in New York. And then so-called Striketober was going to hit. Since then, and the increase of unionization victories in the service sector in specific, mostly around the Starbucks unionization campaign, I have been told that we see an increase of, quote, white-collar workers in unions. None of this is entirely true. The only truth to it is we did see an increase of union militancy from the COVID levels back to what it was. And then a massive step, um, which was actually a massive decline from the years of 2018 and 19, where there were massive strikes in the United States that got very in barely any attention, even from the left. But let's talk about Striketober, and then we'll talk about what the Bureau of Labor Statistics released today. Now, I'm going to be citing a lot of stuff, including a lot of how liberalish news media adjacent to the left has been uncritical of this and actually very confusing. Sometimes if you were to read the same uh, news outlet, you would get reports that indicated opposite things from month to month. And then I'm going to link everything in here today so you know what I'm talking about. I also want to caveat that a lot of people think that I am too down on unions and on union leadership. It's very similar to people who think I'm too down on social Democrats, which is fine. You know, that that's an opinion you can have. But I want people to know, I want us to be honest about this because we can't fix a situation that we don't admit is true. We have to admit that this is going on. We can't just hope and talk about things off of, off of reportings that things are going well when the stats from the organizations that are far more rigorous than most journalistic outlets these days don't back it up. Furthermore, there are structural issues with the elements that are that are unionizing now that we need to talk about. But we'll get into there. Let's talk about the case of Striketober. I'm going to go to a Salon.com article now. I'm on record for years of making making fun of Salon as like a an outlet that I used to take seriously, but now is basically telling the left what it always wants to hear. And by the left, I don't mean even like the socialist left or the democratic socialist left, but mostly just the liberal left. Striketober in full swing is nearly two thousand. 100,000 workers authorized work stoppages in the United States. And that that's true enough. But what that shows you is journalists reporting on this don't really understand scale. Just like when you hear that the 95K and the DSA is a absolutely huge number and you're comparing it to historical left sectarian organizations, which after the 1980s tend to be about 5,000 people or less, 
often down to one or 2,000 people. Um, 100,000 workers authorizing work stop stoppages in a country of... Three hundred and something million. Is three hundred and thirty one point nine million people are in the United States. So a hundred thousand work stoppages is a massive increase from what was going on in COVID, but it wasn't a massive increase, period. And I have to talk about this uh in relationship to Doug Henwood. Now I'm no love Doug Henwood. I often think he's too became too soft in the Democrats after 2017. But his analysis of what the Bureau of Labor Statistics showed is actually accurate. You will notice the high point of of large strikes. We have a bunch of them and they end almost completely after uh going up to 9-11. After 9-11, labor movements, it's self-suppressing, just like you see during most wars, honestly. You have an uptick in 2004, seemingly tied to the election. Uh, also, there was a mini recession in 2003, but there was recovery from it. That's usually a good time for labor to assert itself. Again, the lead up to 2008, when things were getting bad. Then you have a decade of relatively low action and then it peaks back to 2000 levels in 2018 2019 2020 hits while it's decreasing from its 2018 height um and for example in 2019 2020 you have a lot of solidarity strikes then look at this it drops off the cliff to the lowest it's been since 2009 in the last recession during 2020. What people don't know is recessions generally aren't good times for labor activity. You can lose your job easily. It's easy to find people to scab on you during a recession. So when you think about this, and again, Henwood shows up, all that, all you saw in, in Striketober was actually a return to normal aughts level strike activity. Now, we still need to talk about that. Um, ABC News reported on 43 of 225 strikes, or about 72 strikes in October. Um, there were only 54 strikes in the entirety of 2020, but that was a historical low. But let's talk about the areas where there were strikes. There was a strike in the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees to get better working conditions for Hollywood. And by the way, that's also part of the strike pattern that we see. The writer strike is in that strike pattern and in, in, uh, up to 2028, too. Something to think about as you talk about this. The Nabisco strike. Um, the Mercy Hospital strike. The Kellogg strike. Uh, the John Deere UAW strike. A bunch more healthcare strikes. Higher education strikes. And then the unionization of Staten Island. Now, this led to many media outlets noticing that approval for unions was at an all time. And we started really paying attention to the growth and service sector union organizations, particularly with Starbucks, as Starbucks themselves started doing more and more anti-union activity. You had liberal outlets like Vox, which I'm going to share what they said, uh, reporting on the following. How unions are winning in four charts. Now, I want to talk about this because this is not, none of the stuff in these charts is false, but they actually do convey a misleading picture of what the Bureau of Labor Statistics data actually shows. 
unions won more elections in 2022 than they had in nearly 20 years, which is absolutely true. But part of that is the nature of the elections had changed. So, for example, the average Starbucks elections, which is where a lot of these actually happened, uh, made up Starbucks elections alone. If you look at this number right here, 230 made up almost a, over a third of the entirety of the 641 number. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you pretty clearly that one of the reasons why there are so many more union shops winning is the shops being voted on are smaller. The average Starbucks um, Starbucks employees probably left 50 people. Okay, so actually it's more than that. Uh, so the average Starbucks employee employ about twenty people per team. If you think about the number of teams involved in that, uh, that means in a store throughout a section might have three or four teams and might be 400 people. But usually it's about 20 people per store. So if you figure that out and you run through those numbers, you think, okay, so if we're just taking the, the average 20 times 200 that that we are only dealing with an increase of 5,000 workers for 230 unionization votes. All right? So think about what Box is not telling you there. That, that part of the reason why there's more unionization votes winning, um, which is a good thing. You're not... I'm not... Uh, saying it isn't. Is that, frankly, each is a smaller portion of the labor force per vote. All right. Unions are running more than three quarters of their votes. But again, if we see that one sixth of them is dealing with 20 people at a time, and if you compare that to a factory which often employed five, six, three, four, 10,000 people, you see that it's a change in the nature of work itself that's leading to this. So the, so the NCLRB can say, well, you know, we're up 60% in unionizations, and that's a good thing. But they'll say, you'll read, I'll highlight this, experts credit the rise in organizing in parts of the pandemic. During the global crisis, many countries have since unionized, called their employees essential workers, but didn't train it when it came to wages, benefits, and safety. I want you to notice, though, that Vox doesn't actually say who these experts are, where they're coming from, and if they're actually specialists in unionization. All right? This has become common in reporting. There are three times as many workers that went on strike and in 2022 as in 2021. But remember that Striketober, which began 2021, is just the ending of a strike lull that was one of the lowest strike activity periods in modern U.S. history. What we're actually seeing, if you look at even Doug Henry's thing, is a return to the, to the pre-2017 normal. Vox also credits an increase in union approval rate. Now, that's true. 
but let's look at what the Bureau of Labor Statistics has to say today and really parse it because its report is much more clear. I'm just going to read it. According to the union members 2022 report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, Union membership, the percentage of wage and salary workers who are members of unions, went down to 10.1%. Now, I've been saying union leadership was about, you know, I mean, union membership was about 12 to 16%. I've been overestimating by about 6% based off of old 90s numbers, apparently. It fell down from 10.2% in 2021, which itself was a decrease from a recent high in 2019. The number of wage and salary workers belonging to unions for 14.3 million increased, so it did increase, by 273,000 or 1.9%. By the way, that's higher than the, the AFL-CIO's own goal here. Uh, the, the AFL-CAO's future work program only wants a growth of 1%, which does outstrip current population growth, but current population growth is historically low. Disproportionately large increases in number of total wage and salary workers compared to the increase of union membership led to a decrease in union rates. So there was a larger increase in non-union jobs and union jobs despite an increase in unions. The unionization rate of 10.1 of is the lowest unionization rate on record. How can you have the lowest unionization rate on record with a lot of left-wing activists and people adjacent to a Democrats telling you you're seeing a renaissance of labor? That is, the renaissance of labor is not real. All right? It is like once you actually look at the statistics and why the statistics are the way they are, and if people just did not put any amount of critical thinking into reading these these kind of slapdash explainers from frankly liberal sources, they would know what was going on. In 1983, the first year comparable union data are available, so we don't collect, funnily enough, we don't even collect good data on the high point from the high point of unionization in the 70s. Union memorization rate was 20.1%, and there was 17.7 million workers in a population that was about 100, that was about what, 100 million less? It was U.S. population in 1980. Let's figure that out. It was 100 million less, almost exactly 100 million less. So there were more no workers in real numbers in a population that was much smaller in 1980 than now. Here's what the data shows on specifics, all right? Union membership of the public sector remains about 33.1%, all right? Continued to be more than five times higher than the rate of private sector workers. That means, by the way, that a third of that that excuse me that more people in unions than not are not covered by the national labor relations act because service sector workers generally are not covered by the national labor relations act all right now a lot of people really only discovered this when the railway unions happen because the railway unions are also not covered by the National Labor Relations Act. But people focusing on increased stuff at the National Labor Relations Board and don't look at how few even union workers are represented by that are being foolish. The highest unionization rates were in protective services, which again, only 30.1%. That's education, training, and library occupations. And then in education, training, and library occupations. So the number one uh, protective, protective services is code for cops, my friends. The reason why, for example, when everybody was calling for the AFL-CAO to kick out the cops is because that's the largest sector of their base. 
men have continued to have a high, higher uh, unionization rate than women, 10.5% versus 9.6%. Uh, the gap in unionization rates for men and women has narrowed considerably since 1983, where the rates for men and women were 24% and 14% respectively. Black workers uh, remain more likely to be in unions than white, Asian, and Hispanic workers, mostly because black workers are, are more represented in government work. Um, that's a history. That's part of the legacy of racism in America is federal employees actually kept in that non-discrimination acts. Non-union workers have a broad a median range of about, a median range earnings of about 85% of the earnings for workers who are in unions. So it's still you know, good for you to be in a union. Do not hear me say that. Uh, here's where stuff gets real depressing. Union membership has changed over the year in the public sector. After the decline of the prior year, public sector unions continued to decline. The rate went down 0.8%. You know why that is? At least in the case of teaching and healthcare, it's because people are leaving the job. And 2002 union membership rate continued to its highest in local government, 38.8%. So while the federal jobs are better, they're actually less unionized. The number of workers employed by the private sector increased. So this is where the biggest growth is. Um, 193,000. Private sector unionization rate edged down by 0.1% uh, in 2022 to 6%. Industries with high unionization rates include utilities, 19.6%, motion picture and sound recording industries, 17.3%, and transportation and warehousing, 14.5%. Low union ration in place, including insurance, finance, professional and technical services, food services and drinking places. So despite the increase in the service sector, which is where a lot of the increase is, they're still under 2%. Occupational groups, the highest unionization rates were protective services. Again, that's cops, education and training. Um, and the lowest were sales, computer and mathematical occupations, food preparation, and management. Now, the last three make sense. Like, they are already well compensated. Let's look at the race breakdown. All right. Well, I said black workers have, I continue to have a higher union membership than rate in 2022, 11.6% versus white workers, 10.6%. Asian workers, 8.3%. And Hispanic workers, 8.8%. Unionization rate declined by 3% for white workers, while it increased by 0.06% for Asian workers. Union memberization rates for Black and Hispanic workers remained about the same. Union membership for full-time workers, 11%, is more than double that of part-time workers. Union representation went up more than union member uh, went up slightly in areas where union represent, now how does that work? Well, some areas where the union represents you for contract bidding, um, you don't have to be a member to benefit from that. But here's another really depressing thing. 30% of almost all union members live in two states, California and New York. High population states, but nonetheless. So what's going on and why have you heard so much about this increase in unionization? This is from MSNBC. Employees everywhere are organizing. Here's what's happening now. First half of, of 2022 saw a spike in union petitioning companies from airlines to retail to unionizations. Political environments, communication across country lines and COVID-19 played the biggest role in creating a national labor movement. But this is the same i'm going to just show that this is i'm going to show this from the same magazine here same year 
Uh, it's just a different part of the year. It's from May. This is from August, so after the summer. The union, the American public is back in love with labor unions, so why aren't workers? Most top U.S. brands from Apple to Chipotle, Starbucks, and Amazon are, uh, are facing increased unionization efforts among frontline and retail unions employees. The American public has the workers back with a new Gallup poll finding the support for the unions has reached its highest level since 1965. But the Gallup poll data also shows how difficult it will be in turning general support into widespread organizing activity as majority of non-union workers tell Gallup poll that they have no interest in joining the union movement. New York Times actually reports roughly the same thing. Although this is from this is from early this year. The US labor movement is popular, prominent, and also shrinking. All right, this is from last year, excuse me. This is from January of last year. And again, this goes over some of the stats I've turned down. Union membership has steadily fallen since 1985. The reason why it doesn't go back is because we don't have the data for that. But the data in the 50s and 60s, you could double or triple that union membership. The it's just a year of later where relations wasn't keeping up with it back then. The share of union uh, by sector is just what I told you, and that hasn't really changed. We've seen this data backs up this, the data as provided by Doug Henwood. Work stoppages are super high, actually are super high in the early 80s. They're high again in the late 90s and very early 2000s. They collapse after 9-11. Uh, they are now, see, they're barely, they're not even at mid-aughts rates. And mid-aughts rates were low. But approval of labor continues to go up. So people love the idea of unions, but they don't seem to want to join them. Also, the idea that it's mostly white-collar workers, and by white-collar, I guess you mean construction industry and service workers, is not true. There's been a marked increase in service work, but remember that service work is the least unionized sector of the economy, only 2%. And that's when I'm rounding up. Now, Jacobin, for all I like to give it shit, has actually done a lot better on this and actually pointed out one of the weird ironies of this situation. Labor membership has gone down, but net assets have increased. Now, how does that happen? Now, Bill Bradley, and I've talked about this for many years since I talked about it with uh, uh, Michael Brooks in 2018, pointed out that labor leadership started getting paid in stock dividends at the, in the 70s. You can see here, this is paid off for them. Labor Organized labor has dramatically increased their net assets while losing millions and millions of, of, of members. Looking at the financial data provides some answers. This is from uh, Chris Bonner's Now It's Time for Unions to Go on the Offensive. The revenue increase was driven by higher union membership dues per member. So dues have gone up while membership has gone down. So the average union member is paying more for being represented by the union, rising from a roughly $800 per member per year in um, 2010 to $1,090 uh, $1, in 2020. Um, most union dues are set as a percentage of raises. So as union raises rise, union dues also increase. That's not always true, though. In addition, there's a significant increase in investment income, rental income from labor's vast holdings of real estate makes up 47% of its overall revenues. As revenues rose 28%, total spending on paying organizers and funding campaigns did not keep pace, only increasing 70% in 2010. So Jacobin has actually done some good reporting about this, but it indicates that, yeah, labor has been investing in stocks and land. That's what labor leadership is doing. So they have the revenue that they do, despite the fact that there's not generally an increase. Now, there's more in that. Here. 
in that uh let me show you this fixed real estate and assets investments other assets cash and equivalents from dues look at this investment labor's assets investment for uh 15.2 billion dollars in investment declining le union leadership is not perversely an existential threat to organized labor um, leadership it's just not they have invested so much in the private market that they don't need an increase in dues my friends stop being slipped by this it is embarrassing that left-wing media has been talking about an increase in in unionization at the moment when unionization in raw numbers has declined the most and it is embarrassing that people think that it is mostly a white collar phenomenon it's just not true and if you don't believe me i'm going to link everything i've showed you today in the notes i'm going to end on this thought if you're invested in a failing strategy and that strategy continues to fail and you continue to do it, you are actually invested in the status quo.